and welcome uh, to all of you out there who are tuning in today to join us for this important webinar on uh, hate, xenophobia, and uh, COVID-19, how higher ed can respond. Uh, my name is Jonathan Friedman, and I am the Program Director for Campus Free Speech at PEN America. I am delighted to be uh, hosting and moderating the session today and to be joined by a group of esteemed colleagues from around the country uh, who I will now ask to introduce themselves. Uh, maybe we'll go Jennifer and then Wanda and then uh, Ricky and then Miriam. Thanks, I wasn't sure who was gonna go first. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ho. I am the director for the Center of Humanities and the Arts at the University of Colorado Boulder. I also have an appointment there in the Ethnic Studies Department as a professor and I am the president of the Association for Asian American Studies. Hi everyone, I'm Wanda Collins. I'm a licensed psychologist and also an assistant vice president in campus life at Emory University and the director of our psychological and counseling services. Hello, I'm Ricky Hall, vice president for the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity and the university's diversity officer at the University of Washington. I'm delighted that PEN America is doing this. So thank you, Jonathan and PEN America Look forward to learning from my colleagues and to our discussion this afternoon. Hi, I'm Miriam Lamb. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief Diversity Officer at University of California, Riverside. I'm faculty in comparative literature and cooperating in ethnic studies. And I'm chair of our UC system wide council of 10 chief diversity officers for the system. Great, thank you all again for joining us. A quick note on structure for today's session. Uh, what we'll be doing uh, in a minute is we will be uh, each of us presenting a little bit about uh, our, our research or our thinking or our, our experience and our, um, you know, our lens on some of the issues that uh, we wanted to discuss and get into discussion today. Uh, after each of us has presented, we're going to open it up for Q&A from the audience. Uh, you can, if you have a question, please do um, put it in the Q&A box at the bottom, but just note that we will be waiting to take up questions until uh, each of us has spoken in the second half. Uh, we're hoping to have a robust period of time for a conversation among us in response to your questions. I think this is an issue that has been on many people's minds in the sector and um, in programming and bringing together these diverse voices, we wanted to especially highlight uh, the different kinds of expertise that are necessary to confront this challenge uh, and think about the different roles that, that, that different people on campuses uh, uh, virtually or in person can play in thinking about uh, how universities and colleges can respond to this moment. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to uh, give a few quick remarks about PEN America for those who don't know. Uh, PEN America is a nearly 100-year-old uh, free expression and literary organization and actually has a very unique mission. Uh, PEN America is the U.S.-based uh, uh, um, uh, center uh, federated with uh, international PEN centers in countries around the world. Uh, and it was uh, created in the wake of the First World War among authors and writers in different countries. And it has continued its advocacy work to both uh, celebrate the written word, celebrate literary excellence, and stand for defending free expression and other civil liberties that make free expression possible. Today we work in the U.S. around the world. Uh, we uh, advocate for viewing free speech as a human right for all. We uh, speak and defend the right of all to um, uh, uh, participate in discourse, discussion, and for the unimpeded circulation of ideas and arts across borders. Uh, we defend writers, journalists, and their allies, and we celebrate and amplify uh, voices from historically marginalized and unheard communities. Now, all of that work takes place uh, beyond higher ed, but in our uh, particular uh, division, we focus on uh, how these issues play out on college campuses, and I'm sure many of you know that they have been uh, very much in the news and very much on people's minds in higher education in recent years. We have tried to be a voice of um, uh, you know, a kind of open convener of conversation, a voice for uh, reason and uh, practical and principled ways that uh, different administrators and faculty can respond to different situations that arise, whether they are in the classroom, in the residence hall, or in the quad, or really just about anywhere else uh, online uh, increasingly too. Um, and so what we do in our program is we try and translate uh, PEN America's thinking and its experience with a lot of these issues uh, into ways that are um, practically applicable for the higher education sector. 
I want to just quickly point out our campus free speech guide, which has a URL at the bottom of the screen here, campusfreespeechguide.pen.org, that houses all of our uh, unique advice with sections for faculty, administrators, and students. And if you haven't seen it before, I encourage you to please check it out. Now, finally, um, I will say that one of the things that is unique about PEN America as well is not only are we a free expression organization with a long-term commitment to these principles, uh, but we also have as part of our commitment and as part of our charter since 1948, a commitment of members of PEN America to dispel all hatreds. Um, and that is, is a unique position to take as a free expression organization where we have tried to find the right balance between um, issues of free speech, issues of hateful expression and bigotry in society, and think very much in terms of higher education, how uh, the ideals of free speech and the ideals of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, can coexist on our campuses. Um, so with that, I'm delighted to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Jennifer Ho, who's going to help us situate the current moment in terms of thinking about the racism and xenophobia that we've seen on the rise uh, across society. Hi, everyone. I'm hoping to share a PowerPoint presentation that perhaps some of you have seen. I made it widely available on Twitter, where you could fill out a Google form. And I'm really fortunate that my university, the University of Colorado Boulder, has also created a website with a shareable PDF. Um, so Jonathan, I'm not sure if I have screen share abilities, or if you or someone at PEN America can share. They, they should be there for you. Is it, if it's not working, we can adjust. Ah, I see it. Okay. 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 I think that's, yes, I think this is working. Okay. So I'm not going to go through the entire PowerPoint. I believe that PEN America will be sending this out or has sent it out to people who registered. Um, but if you do want a copy, um, or if you know others who want a copy, you can go to my Twitter feed, which is D-R-J-E-N-H-O at Dr. Jen Ho. There's a pinned tweet that will give you instructions on how to get a copy. Um, so I just want to skip to why I did this PowerPoint. I had in, been seeing things on Twitter, in the news, certainly if you were paying attention to any of the press house briefings, you heard President Trump use the phrase Chinese virus. And indeed, several um, more conservative news commentators and Republican legislators have also been saying the phrase Chinese virus. I haven't known whether any of them are stepping back from that because I tend not to watch Fox News, for example. Um, but recently, as of a week ago, I did see campaign literature that came out of a congressperson in Texas. And in her campaign materials, she had a map of the United States with arrows running across it going east to west with the phrase Chinese virus. And she was telling people that she was she had President Trump's back and um, blaming the virus on China and advocating for an end to all trade with China as well. So the fact is that pe there are still people who are using this phrase. And I wanted to simply ask the question, which appeared on my Facebook feed from an old high school friend, why it was not okay to say Chinese virus. And I decided to take that really seriously and answer that question and then build out a whole PowerPoint, because I think in order to understand where the racism of the phrase Chinese virus comes from, you have to understand that there's a much longer history of anti-Asian racism that has happened in the US. And I say anti-Asian racism, even though the title of the Pan America talk, which I'm entirely grateful for, is on xenophobia, because the mistaken identity with which all Asians, particularly East Asians, are lumped into the category of Chinese means that while the hatred may be xenophobic in nature, i.e. targeted towards one specific region, China, the way that that hatred is manifesting is as anti-Asian racism because no one paused to ask the woman in Brooklyn who had acid thrown in her face whether she was actually a Chinese national, Chinese American, or another variety of Asian American. So as you can see, um, the World Health Organization itself has not for the last four years recommended that viruses or any other diseases be named 
according to either ethnicity or ge geography, precisely for the type of stigmatization and racism that um, unfolds as a result. And um, as I document on the second slide, the argument I kept hearing again and again was, well, if it's okay to say Spanish flu, why isn't it okay to say Chinese virus? Now, any arguments that have to go back 100 years and say, if it was okay 100 years ago that we did X, why can't we do it now, should immediately make everyone pause. There were lots of things that were, we did 100 years ago as a nation that now in the year 2020, we would all agree are bad things to do. And so just because it was called Spanish flu in 1918, which actually there's a whole history of how that's not even correct in terms of where it originated, certainly doesn't mean that we do it now. Okay. I think the other thing I wanna really stress, and then I, I will stop, is a lot of times people wanna know, what can I do? How can I be someone who is working against racism? And what's really important to note is that if you don't actively act in a racist manner, that's great. You are being a really decent human being. But that's not the same as being anti-racist, especially in this day and age, especially with the kind of virulent, violent racism that is emerging or not emerging is around. So if you want to be anti-racist, it's really simple. You have to decide I'm going to be anti-racist, which means I'm going to educate myself about the history of racism, at least in the United States. And then I'm going to act and talk in a manner that is anti-racist. In other words, it's not enough simply not to say racist things. You have to actually be someone who does and says anti-racist things. And it seems simple to me, but I get that it's not in a lot of situations and that we all have to be in a moment where you think, is this an educational moment? Should I be speaking out? And I guess what I'm, I'm here to say is I think as much as we can try and encourage one, ourselves and one another to get educated and to speak out, I think the better we're going to be in trying to tackle the types of systemic racism that we see now, and then in particular is acute with the Asian American community. Thank you. I will stop my screen share. Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, we're gonna move into our second presentation from Wanda at uh, Emory talking about some of the uh, impacts that some of these hateful things have on, on students and, and how we can think about those issues. Oh, sorry, Wanda, you're uh, still on mute. Okay, there. Can you see my slides okay? Yeah? Yeah, we can see them well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I want to talk to you today from the perspective of um, my experience as a psychologist and as a therapist um, for the past 20 years. Um, so to, to answer a few questions, the first is, is really about the intense stress that COVID-19 has on all of us and sort of the impact of that. And one of the things that we're experiencing um, is just a really heightened level of fear and uncertainty. Um, okay. um, for all of us, and whenever we feel afraid, and, and a good example of a way to think about this is if you're out hiking and you come around the corner and you see a bear on your path, um, your body is gonna have a natural um, physiological reaction that's intended to promote your safety. So you're either going to fight the bear you're gonna run from the bear or you're gonna freeze. And that's an automatic reaction um, that we have. The other thing that happens for us psychologically is that we go into this mode of dichotomous thinking. And this is also intended to ensure our survival. So we start to categorize things in terms of safe or dangerous, good or bad. Um, and in the case of um, people, we look at people in terms of in-group, out-group. And again, this is a mechanism that we that we all experience as a way of ensuring our safety. The, the issue with the current pandemic is that we're not actually able to see the object of our fear, and we don't know when the danger will end. So when we talk about a fear response, it's usually something that's happening over a, a discrete period of time, and then that, that, that fear stimulus, it ends, 
and your body sort of goes back to, to normal. But what's happening now is that these processes are amplified and it tends to breed feelings of helplessness, anger, um, and resentment. Um, Um, so the pandemic has really amplified our need for safety and control in an uncertain world. And there's lots of things that we do when we're trying to help people focus on their self care, um, which is to focus on things in their environment that they can control, like eating well or exercise or managing our time. Um, but in the context of, of our current environment, we're also impacted by political forces, by cultural forces, by economic forces. And for people who have um, unconscious or conscious bias, prejudice, and certainly misinformation, um, they might look for people who are part of an part of an out group um, to blame. And that blaming, that being able to locate the problem somewhere or in someone, gives them a false sense of security and control. And unfortunately, for for some people, these feelings of fear can turn into feelings of hate and disgust. And part of that process in, involves uh, dehumanization of others that allows a person to justify seeing people suffer and having that be okay or actually causing harm to other people. And this hatred actually numbs our feelings of guilt and shame and that reduces the psychological conflict. And when we don't have that psychological tension, we're more likely to engage in that, in that type of behavior. Um, in terms of the impact of hate and xenophobia on victims, um, one way to think about expressions of hate is that they're forms of verbal or physical abuse. And they're really meant to exert control, to silence people, um, and to instill fear in, in people. And we often think about this in the context of um, personal relationships or family violence where you have one person who's the abuser. And in that kind of situation, the person who's being abused or the people who are, who are victims of that type of verbal or physical abuse, they know who their abuser is and they can at least respond accordingly. But when you talk about xenophobia and racism, the person suffering has to deal with the fact that they're walking around knowing millions of people out there might also share these views and also have access to power. And this makes both the immediate circumstance that, that they're in and the larger world that they're in feel more dangerous. And research has actually shown that victims of violent hate crimes, as opposed to other types of violent crimes, have more, are more likely to experience ongoing psychological distress. So that can be in terms of ongoing safety concerns, feelings of anger, or psychological conditions like depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress disorder. And for the rest of us who may not have actually experienced this type of verbal or physical abuse, watching people with whom we identify that have similar identities, watching this happen to them can also increase our own fear uh, and lower self-esteem. So if you're, if you're um, confronted with someone who is acting in a racist or xenophobic way, um, some things you can do to be helpful. If someone is being victimized, probably the most important thing you can do is try and support that person's immediate physical and emotional safety. And that might happen through, distract through distraction, helping the person get out of the situation, um, intervening if it, if it feels um, comfortable for you to do that. And one buffer against the negative psychological impact of hate and xenophobia um, is to have people speak up. So even if you don't know what to say, a simple statement of dissent, um, I disagree with you, or of concern, asking the person who's being victimized if they're okay, checking in with them, can be really helpful. Because si if, if you're silent, that person can end up sort of questioning their reality. And so it's very grounding for a person um, to have other people around them confirming that whatever happened to them was wrong. Um, if someone's in a rage, it's probably not helpful in terms of changing their perspective to argue with them. It's sort of like arguing with someone who's drunk. Um, but that said, there may be times where the most appropriate thing to do um, is to intervene or to say something. And if you have a relationship with someone who holds these types of views, 
Um, it can be really helpful to try and engage them in a conversation from a space of curiosity and really trying to understand their concerns because what we're trying to do is um, open up the potential for them to think about the situation differently, become more educated and maybe change their perspective. Um, one of the things that often happens on social media is somebody will, will post something that is um, hateful or distasteful and people will respond um, with uh, strong counter, counter arguments, um, which is not to say that they, that they shouldn't do that, but often what happens, especially in a public forum, is if somebody feels ashamed um, or that they're being shamed, they will double down in order to, to sort of save face and protect their ego. Um, so having a private conversation with somebody can be a lot more effective. And then finally, um, in terms of changing, helping people shift their attitude, um, the research has shown that reducing fear um, can help people sort of expand their thinking and expand their possibility. So if you, if you remember when we talked about the bear, sort of you're out hiking, you come around the corner and you see the bear, when people are in that fear response, they tend to have very sort of concrete black and white thinking. So if we can reduce people's fears, um, then there's the potential for them to think more flexibly about what's happening in their environment and the information they're confronted with. And similarly, um, promoting empathy, helping people see that we're, we're in this shared humanity, um, that we're all part of the human condition is a foundation for promoting mutual respect, which is, a, which is an important step in, in reducing racism and xenophobia. Um, so the, the topic can, can get kind of heavy um, when we think about everything that's happening in the news, but we also see every day in the news um, sort of the best versions of, of humanity. And I like to um, remind myself that we're all on a journey um, and from a racial identity development perspective that we're at different places on the path and that um, we all have the capacity to grow and change and be more compassionate towards others. I would say most of us, because um, for some for some people who are antisocial, I, I would say that that's probably not the case. But for most of us, there's an opportunity to change and grow. And then I have a picture on the screen of Congressman John Lewis, who's one of my um, heroes in the world. Um, and he was involved in an incident in the um, in the freedom freedom rides back in the in 1960s, where he was. Um, approached by a Klansman, um, a group of Klansmen who um, beat him severely. But this Klansman um, felt regret for his behavior and he started to change his perspective. Um, and over the, over the course of several decades later, he actually reached out to John Lewis to apologize for his behavior um, and to ask for forgiveness, which Mr. Lewis granted. So this is a story that I always think about um, that gives me hope when I start to Thing about some of the negative things that are happening in the world um, because I think it's a, a situation where someone who seemed pretty impossible or incapable of changing their perspective was able to do that and there was a, a space of reconciliation. So I'll stop there. Thanks Wanda uh, very much and um, uh, to, to Jennifer again as well. Um, I just want to remind people who are watching, uh, we are taking questions in the Q&A box. So uh, if you have them, uh, please feel free to put them in there. We will get to them uh, after the, all the presentations. And um, additionally, we are recording the session and, and the slides uh, will be made available uh, at the end. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn to our two chief diversity officers who we have on the panel today to kind of react to some of the things that they are, they've heard here and uh, tell us how they think about this question, you know, how higher ed uh, should respond. I think, Ricky, you're up first. Well, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, and certainly uh, what my colleagues shared um, was enlightening, um, and especially uh, I was thinking about what Jennifer was saying, and I talk about this a lot, too, about um, being an anti-racist and the importance of acting. And so that notion of speaking and acting was so important. And then also um, really um, what Wanda was saying resonated with me because I really am a big fan of Johnny Powell's work on um, bonding, uh, bridging and breaking. And, um, and John um, Powell, um, as he, he notes that when people are fearful, it's, it's easy for them to, to turn to breaking. And 
This is especially true when those in leadership positions are actually working to, to divide and are playing on fears. And it's easy to place blame on the other. And so we know that this, is, this pandemic has many of us uh, fearful, many of us afraid. And so um, this is a time where people are turning to, uh, to other others. And so in terms of the campus context, I often say that we can't guarantee that there will never be acts of xenophobia or racism on campus. However, um, you can mitigate the prevalence of such incidents by regularly communicating your values, challenging those acts when they arise, and certainly ensuring those who have been targeted are supported. And in this moment, that we find our, ourselves in moments like this. This is where um, there's, when there's great fear and so many who are hurting, um, I often will say to leaders, you know, when we're challenged, this is a time that our institutional values should really drive us. And, and, and I point that out because I, I don't know a higher education institution that doesn't claim that they have a commitment to diversity and inclusion and when I give talks, I, I often will say that you will never find a president, chancellor, or dean who is not committed to diversity. And uh, people kind of chuckle because, of course, I'm being um, facetious. But my point is, is that is it just empty rhetoric when we say those things um, on our campus? Is it something nice to say? Or is there really a strong commitment there on our campus? Are these institutional um, commitments espoused, espoused values or are they actionable? And, and that's a real critical question that I think we need to be asking on our campus communities um, when these things come up. I will say um, here at the University of Washington, we had a couple reports of things that were said in classes that were xenophobic or certainly microaggressions. And this was at the beginning of the spread of the virus in, in China. So it was before um, any uh, cases were here in the US. And it was our, our student leader stepped up. First, the director of our diversity efforts for our student government, um, which here is called the Associated Students of the University of Washington. She sent out a message to all students, reminding them that the spread of the virus was not an excuse for racism. And, and, and she was educating students that even referring to the virus as the, the China virus or Wuhan virus was xenophobic and racist. And she ended her message by communicating um, who we are uh, striving to be as a campus community and reminded students that we are in this together. Then after, you know, as you know, that the, here in Seattle, we were the first area where there were actually some reported cases. And after those cases were reported here in the Seattle area, the president of the student government sent out a message to students. And her message called on students to take the necessary precautions, certainly to, to stay safe and be healthy. But she ended by calling on us to be um, our better selves during this, this challenging time. And the president of the student government uh, stated, um, and I'm gonna read her quote, uh, her message. She stated, quote, COVID-19 is not an excuse for racism, xenophobia, or harassment. Show empathy, kindness, and support to one another as our community deals with COVID-19. So the president of the university and the student leaders here at the University of Washington set the tone for how we would respond to this pandemic at our university. And their constant messaging about being in this together certainly resonated with me and, and most across the campus community. And I think that's why um, we've had so few cases of xenophobia and acts of discrimination um, tied to COVID-19. And I'll end my remarks there. Thanks so much, Ricky. Um, so now we'll turn to Miriam from the University of California, Riverside. Same question, how should higher ed respond? Yeah, thanks. I was reading the questions in the chat box as I was listening to Ricky and they're really great questions too. So I hope um, 
we get a chance to talk about that. And I hope to, I, I'm sorry if I'm gonna come off as the institutional tool of the group, but I am having to triage a lot of this from the administrative side of things. And so a lot of my um, comments will be sort of what has UCR and the UC system been trying to do to navigate some of these issues. Um, personally, the first I was concerned about it was seeing reports of different Asians getting beat up and um, a colleague of mine, Ruha Benjamin, who's African American at Princeton, she was getting Zoom bombed with her um, children um, uh, uh, spaces. And um, so I, we already, of course, had a sense that it was bigger than anti-Chinese, bigger than yellow peril, again, anti-Asian, that it was um, as you know, xenophobia, hate forms of discrimination are often tied to socioeconomic reasons, tied to other forms of um, justification to um, exploit other forms of um, injustice. And so um, we were already sort of thinking about those things when the COVID-19 and social distancing and stuff really ramped up. And so on our campus, um, our student affairs division, like Ricky was saying, our associate uh, vice chancellor and dean of students over there really did want to send out messaging that wasn't just reactionary, that wasn't a response to these things that were happening, but wanted to kind of get ahead with messaging about how we understand student pressures, anxieties, that they're returning to their homes are different domestic situations with uh, the lack of student support services, counseling and psychological um, services, different ethnic, gender, race, sexuality facing student programs that they see as their alternative family on campus, right, that was a safe space for them, free from different forms of discrimination, hate, and xenophobia. And so for them to lose that is already a very anxiety producing moment. And so um, um, she sent out messaging of that sort as well, co-signed with our chief diversity officer. And then along with that, I think there needed to be very consistent messaging from all the senior administrators, right? From um, the chancellor and provosts to the Senate faculty chair, right? To a student and staff facing communications, really ensuring that as an institution, we are adhering to our principles of community and respect and such especially and uh, more so during extreme circumstances um, than you know during our everyday forms of uh, social, political, and institutional discrimination, right? And so uh, given that we did experience some Zoom bombing and it wasn't necessarily anti-Asian in our campus, it was anti-Black, right? And so we know that folks, hateful folks come out of the woodwork and target all forms of um, minoritization during these moments. And it was targeted at a professor, not even a student, right, during the middle of a class. And so um, the administration, all of the units from um, IT, right, um, technology, undergrad education, academic affairs, um, our centers for teaching and learning um, really got right on it, not only to investigate, is this a hacker? Is it a student? Is it, where is it coming from? And referring that those to student conduct, if it is internal, referring it to investigation. You know, the FBI has guidance out on Zoom bombing right now. And so making use of those kinds of um, mechanisms and then all of the IT and academic affairs staff really working with our faculty and grad instructors on how you add security measures to your Zoom, how you add passwords to student participants, how you do all of this. And I have to say the faculty and grad students and everyone have been great, uh, including our students. And then speaking on behalf of the UC system, um, you know, the UC has a center for uh, free speech um, based in DC, but also based at UC Irvine. And um, as a system, we also felt as a council of chief diversity officers that we needed to send out some guidance uh, also because the, uh, you know, very public uses of the Chinese virus and such by political leaders and such, but, um, well, I don't, know, I don't know if I'll say leaders, but, but um, so the, we put out some guidance that's on the Office of the President website um, regarding how do you behave more respectfully and conscientiously during these kinds of cl uh, climates. And we got initial great reaction responses from colleagues, uh, such as those on the um, call today, um, asking if they could use 
some of the language and do it for their institutions and such, which was really nice that we can, as institutions of higher education, really band together nationally. Um, and then we got a, a, a tiny bit of pushback saying, oh, are you saying faculty can't call it the Chinese virus? Is this going to be, are you impinging on their academic freedom? Are you going to be disciplining these professors? And if these folks, uh, you know, small minority that they are actually read academic freedom policies in the UC system and elsewhere, I imagine they would know that no, you wouldn't be disciplining them in any particular way, but as a campus with principles, you have every right to encourage folks to be on the right side of history. Um, and so I think um, we really need to have this kind of shared united front and messaging in terms of um, how to deal overtly as a critical mass, as a united front against um, hate and xenophobia, because we know during times of expediency and, and crisis situations, um, aggravation of disparities and inequities come up, even when you're trying to mitigate labor um, injustice and um, financial considerations and such. And so um, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think, um, thank you, Mariam. You raised a, a really good point about um, the difference between you know, the different ways that we can respond to hateful and bias and, and bigoted inc inc incidents on our campuses and the difference between the expectation that the only response is discipline. And of course, there are situations where discipline does make sense, um, but also situations where there are other ways of responding educationally through by the university speaking out in the way that you uh, mentioned, Ricky, um, uh, or, or other restorative justice practices where you try to bring people together and uh, have them in conversation with one another. Um, we are going to now turn to the Q&A and I'll, I'll kind of be uh, selecting the ones uh, from the Q&A. We're going to try and get to all of them and we're going to try and take them up somewhat thematically. But um, the one that came first, I think, is, is really relevant, which is, you know, cross cuts across, I think, all of your jobs, really, which is how do you talk about these things? So um, the question was raised uh, specifically, what is the best way to discuss the origins of the virus in Wuhan and China and the wet markets, uh, which appear now to be the cause of this virus? Um, uh, how to discuss that, how to discuss the actions of the Chinese government, uh, which have largely been to suppress news of the virus or um, uh, in otherwise uh, penalize or, or, or silence um, voices. There was news out this week uh, that universities in China were prohibiting some faculty, some professors from reporting on um, any findings related to the origins of the virus. So how do we in the US and in higher education grapple with, I think, um, you know, those realities uh, without having our conversations verge into uh, xenophobia, into racism, into anti-Asian sentiment. And I'll, I'll start by directing this one to Jennifer, but then I'm happy for anyone to, to respond. Yeah, I think absolutely, if there is an educational reason to be talking about the origins of the virus, that it becomes an educational moment to also talk about how there is a difference between talking about the Chinese government in this moment and the people of China, just as there is a difference in talking about the federal government of the United States and who the leadership of the federal government of the United States is versus the people who live in the United States. And so I think this is a great way to talk about here's how the virus started how it mutated from the animal population into the human population. It happened to occur in the Wuhan region of China. Here was the Chinese government's response. And then here's why using a phrase like Chinese virus is not recommended by the WHO. And here's how we can separate what happens in China from Chinese nationals in the United States, Chinese Americans, and Asian Americans. In other words, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about a larger history of xenophobia and racism against Asians in the US. And then potentially also to talk about various things. If I, can, if I can actually just take Kim Park Nelson's question because she asked also about this phrase, the virus doesn't discriminate. And I've been seeing that happen a lot too. I haven't had a conversation with anyone about that phrase, but I think my rejoinder, if someone you know, were to say, well, you know, the virus doesn't discriminate, I would say that's true, right? Diseases generally, you know, don't discriminate actively. Discrimination is a social and a political process. And in the United States, people discriminate, which, which is one of the reasons we are seeing the vast disparities 
in fatality among African American populations. And so while we may be able to say, yes, the virus, this particular virus is not discriminating, we also have to recognize the systemic and historical inequities that have prevented, let's just take one population, African Americans, from having better health outcomes overall. And so of course, what, is, what we're seeing now is that African Americans are, are having, um, what's what I'm looking for? Um, a disproportionate number of fatalities relative to the population, which I think points out that there is clearly racial discrimination and inequity happening among African Americans in the United States. Any others on this question of, of how do we talk about these things? How do we facilitate conversations? You know, I think, you know, if I'm a professor and this is going on, you know, what responsibility do I have to have a conversation about it and to have a conversation where, you know, someone might say something that is, that I, you know, think is wrong or objectionable or offensive, but how do I kind of steer the conversation um, towards a place where people are reflexive, people are understanding, you know, everything you're saying, Jennifer, about why this phrase is just so heinous, uh, even though, yes, maybe this thing started in Wuhan, it seems it did, um, but, but um, you know, how do you, how do you have that conversation? Does anybody have any thoughts about it? I just wanted to add also that I think we need to also bifurcate or distinguish some of the general anxieties and uh, fears around Chinese government, uh, you know, stifling of information and um, uh, news about the uh, virus and such, but also from then what's going on with xenophobia in the U.S. and these uh, slurs that they use against China, because much of that, as it's attached to Trump and such, is about de deflecting blame, right? I mean, it, he came on harder this week when more blame was cast on him, right, including by others in his cabinet and members of the GOP and other conservative governors and such, and so he's ramping up his blame for every single, you know, World Health Organization all of that, right? And so maybe just distance some of the how we respond to these notions of Chinese uh, uh, responsibility from political attacks against China and um, recognizing that, you know, nobody's very clear yet. I mean, there are conspiracy theories that the, you know, COVID-19 emanated out of a test tube and then got into the animals, right? There are, you know, we, we don't know how this is going to play out over time. And rather than sort of focusing on that, the fact that Trump is bragging about closing down travel from China actually is, again, not helpful because they've already analyzed that the U.S. strain that came into the U.S. came out of Europe into New York. So that it didn't even come directly from China, right? And so I think maybe um, focusing on, yes, we all know governments hide things from their people. Many governments do that. And um, they try to stifle <laughs> dissent like we have here and such. And so emphasizing the fact that, well, which of these facts are going to actually help us deal with the crisis in this situation? Is it by uh, turning off uh, scientific and health organizations that may have the only answers we're going to, you know, get to the end of this with, or, you know, are we going to mount a 90 day investigation of the World Health Organization at this point? Like, what good is that going to do, ex you know, at this point? And so I would just be in favor of if, if this deflection game is happening, let's return it to the kinds of conversations that might be more fruitful. Yeah, and I, I just add uh, quickly that I like to come to some of these conversations, you know, with curiosity. So if, if it came up or a question about the origins, I like to ask, why is that even important? You know, but, but given that somebody makes the case that it is important, I believe in, you know, having our expert or public health experts or medical experts really speak to the issue from a real knowledgeable place. Of part of what I'm finding problematic and challenging is that I see all these people communicating as though they really know they have some expertise when they're putting all these half truths and, and myths and things out there that is really problematic on, on, on many fronts. But if there's a need to know, let, let's have our experts really kind of speak to it. And there's a reality in all of this that it could have originated anywhere, including in the United States. Uh, you know, it really could have, you know, when you think about what's happening. And I think a lesson to learn here is that how interconnected we are, you know, whether people like it or not, you know, we want to be isolationists, but we're so interconnected. And so I really 
try to bring it back to also what should we be learning in this moment? And uh, again, but I, I love everything that Miriam said because some of the conversations we're having and people are engaging in are very problematic. Yeah, and I, I agree with all that's been said. And I would just add from a faculty perspective, if you're having a conversation about this, just knowing that there's a lot of violence and xenophobia happening all over the world, it's an opportunity to be proactive about stating your values and also talking about some of the implications of even having a conversation like that, how it can impact people. Well, actually on that, you know, and, and I, think, I think you're right, Ricky, and, and I often think about the fact that right now we're in a moment where the science is evolving, Miriam. I, I saw that story too about the strains and where they had come from. And I think there's a kind of, you know, there's the science and then there's the social aspects of the ways in which we're conducting the science and the rate at which, you know, what we think we know about this thing changes or, or evolves or, um, uh, you know, intensifies. So I think there's a, a need to be careful about thinking about like, where is the science, where about the origins and all this. Um, um, and, but I appreciate all of your comments about, you know, there has to be a way to have this conversation, but, but do it in a way that is um, empathetic or, or showing curiosity and, um, you know, open, I think, to others. On this question of language, we had a question here from Kate Smith, which I, I wanted to read for you all because I think it's relevant. Um, he writes, in considering how to most effectively and appropriately use language in addressing behavior and characterizing people while living an anti-racist life, um, could we discuss characterizing someone using the term Chinese virus by one, stating that the person is racist, two, stating that the person's behavior is racist behavior, uh, and or three, stating that the person's behavior is racially insensitive behavior. So is it racist? Is it racist behavior? Or is it racially insensitive behavior? Um, could we please talk through the benefits and costs of these three different approaches and, and sharing our thoughts on the ways in which language should be used in responding to these situations, if anyone has a thought? Jennifer, go first, because mine is a bit facetious. No, no, you go first, Miriam. I, I felt like I talked first before. No, I was just going to reference a Real Housewives of Dallas Bravo TV show <laughs> reference in their reunion, their last reunion part two, where everyone called Leanne a racist because she kept saying, calling one of the other participants uh, using Mexican slurs against Mexicans and such. And they all had different opinions. Many of the, oh, she's human, but her, she says things that are problematic. And yes, those statements are racialized. And yes. And then some of the other members said, well, at the end of the day, you are what you say. Um, and so I think there are different ways you can come at this. I don't think it's ever helpful to say, you're racist, because we know from how to deal with microaggressions in the classroom and at department meetings, that's not the way to go to put people on defensive right away, but to also then unpack how horribly offensive and disgusting it was from other folks in the room and how it makes everyone uncomfortable and actually silences conversation, um, drawing out some of the problematic effects of using such racist language. <laughs> so what I was going to share is that um, when I teach any kind of ethnic American critical race theory, which basically means whenever I teach, I tell students that the only word they can't use for the duration of my class is they cannot say racist, in other words, in its adjectival form. And what they especially can't do is stand up and point a finger at another student and say, what you just said was racist, that's racist, you're a racist, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm really clear when I, when I explain to students why, I, why this rule is in place. It's not for me to say people can't be racist because of course we know people can be racist. And it's not to diminish the power of racism. And in fact, it's the opposite. In my experience in, in teaching earlier classes, whenever the accusation was thrown out that what someone had said was racist, it quickly devolved into a verbal spar between two students where the student who's getting attacked says, I'm not racist, you're racist. And then the original point is entirely lost. And so, you know, the first thing is, do I, is saying Chinese virus racist? Yes, it, it is. Is it important for me to say that to someone? Like, you're being racist and using the phrase Chinese virus. No. What I want is to educate them so that they understand using the phrase Chinese virus is inaccurate. 
It has a name. It's been given by the World Health Organization. It's COVID-19. And the World Health Organization has been really clear about why they are naming it COVID-19. And saying the phrase Chinese virus is not innocent. Saying the phrase Chinese virus actually has huge ramifications within a system of racism in which people are now actively being harmed. And so any act of not seeing Chinese virus is you simply being a decent human being that is calling the thing that it was given an official name, right? It's like, if I tell you, I don't wanna be called Oriental because we don't refer to Asians in America as Oriental. We haven't done that for decades. And if you persist in calling me Oriental, that's upsetting to me. And not only is it upsetting, and not only is it inaccurate, in this day and age, it could have serious ramifications for my well-being. And if you persist in doing that, you are now actively causing me harm. Uh, Ricky, any thoughts on this question of language and how we respond to people? That's a, a tough one um, for me. I, I was sitting here listening and um, Jennifer um, was so, so thoughtful about this. And especially when we come to racism, I think, Part of it, you, you have to know people and know people well. Yeah, I mean, because sometimes the people, sometimes people can say things um, that um, are racially insensitive, insensitive, but you know them and you know them well, and they've done other things to show you that they're not necessarily racist. Um, but um, when when I hear those 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 um, a question like that, it, it and I don't know this person, so I don't want to come off though I'm blank, but it's, it's almost like, are we trying to minimize or um, allow people to feel good or, and I get it that you don't want to shut people down, but whether it's racial, uh, what, whether it's racist, racially insensitive, it's harmful. And that's, that's the bottom line for me. And so making sure that people understand that, because unless I know you deeply, I don't know, you know, and, and sometimes we, we, you know, and I might choose not to based on what you're saying and what you're doing to get to know you well enough to know um, whether uh, it's just, you know, from a, a place of lack of knowledge um, or some of those things. But, but, but it's, it's, it's hard for me because I, I don't, something like racism, I really don't want to minimize it in any way because it's so harmful and it's actually, it kills people. And I think we need to be clear about that. Uh, and, and it's often uh, black and brown and, and certainly other, um, other um, groups, but it kills people. Um, we, we look at what's happening with COVID-19 and what's happening um, because of a racist system. You know, um, that's, so let's be clear about that. So I, I just hesitate and I'm very cautious and careful. I wasn't gonna say anything when Jonathan called on me, but because I don't wanna minimize on the impacts of racism in any way. Well, I, I think that it's an interesting perspective to think about, you know, pivoting it from less about whether what you said was, you know, racist by some definition, and we might disagree on what the right, right definition is uh, for every utter utterance ever given, but kind of flipping it to like, regardless of whether you meant it that way or whether you think it's racist, you know, here's how those words impacted me. And I think that's that's very powerful. And it kind of Jennifer, I think coming back to your point, gets us get, can get out of that kind of well, is this or is it not, or what, what did I say or what did you say, um, uh, you know, framework. Um, you know, we've had a few questions here about how we help inoculate students on campus or faculty or others. You know, how do you arm people with um, uh, a kind of, of ways of responding to this for people who might be, you know, unconfident or um, afraid or intimidated? Do any of you have any thoughts about you know what it is that people can do? Well, well, when we do, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You go first, Rick. You go ahead. I already muted. Well, um, for me, always, um, I, I begin with um, education and training. Um, I, I think we got to do our own self work um, so that we can learn. So, as like, um, in order to do better, you got to know better. And so, we have to do our own self work. And, um, and institute, as institutions, we also got to, um, provide opportunities for people to have that learning and to, to gather the knowledge base um, so they can have the skills and hopefully develop the habits to inter, um, interrupt, you know, uh, racism and xenophobia and other acts um, on campus. But 
it has to begin with self and it has to begin with that knowledge. Otherwise you don't know, um, or you inadvertently um, reinforce um, racism, xenophobia and other things because you don't know. And so um, that's where it always begins with me, people's own self work. And so one of the things I'm big on um, is cultivating and maybe you can come out of this too, if there are great resources um, that you can point people to, um, to read, um, whether it's articles, whether it's books, whether it's videos, I mean, um, the materials that Jennifer um, is sharing, and I'm so grateful that she's making that public again, because again, that's knowledge. People have an opportunity. She's putting that out there. People can go through, she's open, you can ask her questions, you know, if you don't understand why, but we have to do our own work. And often what we're doing is we're looking for other people to give us the answers or to do the work for us or to step up on our behalf. The other thing I, I, I will say around this is often people know, and, and sometimes we know, but we're not courageous enough to act, to step forward and to interrupt, to say the things that need to be said. And that's the important piece. And that's the hard part. You know, we talk about institutional racism. And I tell people all the time, that's a tough thing part, a tough for me because individuals make up institutions and I see time and time again, people let things go because it's about self-preservation and being fearful about what might happen to me. And as long as that's the case, these issues will continue to, to exist and, and be prevalent on our campuses. Yeah, I was just gonna say when, I think it really matters if the statements they're making, you can tell if they're coming from uh, bad intentions or if they are just um, subconscious and they're not realizing how offensive what they're saying is. And so when we do faculty trainings around unconscious bias and such, we often um, have the faculty do interactive work and say, okay, somebody has made this statement what can you do? And usually the easiest first thing, even if you're hesitant yourself and don't want to step in the confrontation bill is say, what do you mean by that? Can you explain what you mean by that? Because that is usually enough for them to realize what they've said is problematic and they backpedal very quickly or try to explain it away. But in their explaining away, it actually gives you more content to actually talk and discuss and get process through it, right? Um, there was a question in the chat box about what do you do when students intentionally say hurtful and, you know, uh, things and claim it's free speech, right, that they have free speech. And so our student affairs professionals are the real ones on the front lines and liaisons with this. And I think even with, um, I've noticed what a lot of them do is they sort of sit down with the students and say, what was your intended outcome? What was the goal you were hoping to achieve by making these statements or wearing that MAGA hat or doing these kinds of things, right? And so for them to then have to articulate what their goal was, and then as the student affairs professional, you, you helping them seeing, well, how would, how could you have done this more effectively? Or what is really, you know, upsetting 85% of your student peer group, the most effective way of getting to this outcome, right? Or would, could, could we have done a town hall? Could we have created some other programming for students as a whole, right? You could have been a panelist or round table, right? And so I think our job as the professionals is to guide them towards better ways of having the same conversations, right? Wanda, Jennifer, any comments? I have some comments. So Wanda, do you want to go ahead first? Um, I, I mean, I agree with what other people have saying. I think talking about the um, personal impact of someone's behavior, um, often if someone's entrenched in their perspective, we, we want to start to change their hearts um, in order to change their minds. And so helping them understand the emotional impact of what they're doing. But as Miriam was saying, the context is so important because if someone is saying something just to be provocative, just to get a reaction. Um, it may be that the most appropriate thing to do is not to try and engage them to change their mind, but to say something because the other people in the classroom or around them um, are impacted. And to, to be silent is to um, participate in a gaslighting experience where they're questioning their sense of reality. So sometimes even if you don't know what to say, um, just commenting that I'm not sure what to say, but that really bothered me or I worry about how that impacted other people um, can, can be really helpful. And I think it's important to keep in mind that if you're, not, if you're not immersed in a community, you may not know the amount of violence that's happening. If it's not being covered in the news, 
um, there are people that that are just not not aware and so we are educators right we have an opportunity to educate people and to point people into places where they can educate themselves as Ricky was was saying I really echo what all of my colleagues are saying and the only thing I, I, I just want to add two things one it truly matters I want to really reinforce what Wanda just said it truly matters how we show up as educators in and out of the classroom on and off campus because there are other people who are listening and watching and observing and taking their cues from anyone they perceive in a leadership position. I think we're starved for real leadership in this country. And I certainly know that in my localized community, the university here in Boulder is a place where people are looking for leadership out of the pandemic. And the second thing is, no one is born an anti-racist educator. No one's born a social justice warrior. We all had to learn these things and practice these things. So being anti-racist is, is it's a muscle, right? You, so it's starting small. It's, it's first educating yourself about the history of racism in the US and then practicing having conversations as simple as when someone says something racist to simply say, I don't agree with that or it offends me or I, when I hear you say that, I hear a racist statement. And I think using I statements are useful so that you're not necessarily putting the blame and calling someone racist, but you're, you're standing up for yourself and you're saying, this is not okay. And I think the more people practice that, the more comfortable you get going from, I disagree with that to, you know, there's a whole history of racism embedded in this one comment. And if you're open, I'd love to share what I know and we can have a conversation about this. I want to weigh in myself on that question about uh, free speech and you know people using the term free speech and the concept to mean that they can say anything uh, bigoted or hateful and I think you know the the more that you know there are some who have perceived a sense of kind of political correctness or an effort to stifle their ability to to kind of say whatever they want and I think the more that they are met with people who say uh, you know, that they can't say those things, then the more that they become more attractive to say. I think that there are other uh, better ways to approach those situations, like some of you were talking about, where you can say, well, you know, why are you saying that? Or do you really think it's going to help your goals? But if people want to persist and um, I think say hateful things to others, try to intimidate others, I think that's where the responsibility falls, not just on other students to kind of engage in more speech or counter speech or, you know, confront them and say, you know, hey, you're being harmful to us, but I think there is a a huge onus on the bystanders, the allies, the other people around to kind of stand up for those who are being targeted, but also on the university to to speak to what some of you were talking about, speaking to its values, um, um, being um, provocative and and um, taking a firm stance in the face of some of these things. So that doesn't mean people can't say them, but it also doesn't mean that universities uh, can't be just as vocal and powerful uh, and affirmative in their responses. Um, on this, just looking at the time, we're going to move to a kind of a lightning round. So I'm going to try and pick out as many questions as we can here and just try and get um, some quick responses. So uh, the first one I wanted to go to uh, uh, Ricky, which is, you know, what's the best way if you're on a university campus that's not put any kind of public statement out about uh, anti-Asian racism or other kinds of uh, hate in the community, what do you think is the best way for colleagues, administrators, or faculty on campus to encourage or prompt the university to respond? Well, I always think that it's most powerful um, from students. I don't want to put the onus there, but the reality is that presidents, uh, vice presidents, others, they listen to students sometimes more than they will to faculty and staff. And so if students are calling for this, um, then that's, that, that's one way. But also, um, I, I don't think it should just be students. If it's important, it should be coming from other constituent groups too. And I always say there's no a more powerful force than when you bring together faculty and students that are demanding that um, we, we speak out on some of these things. Um, hopefully, um, you would want to be at a place, hopefully, that they would see that um, you can't comment on everything, but some things are important and they need to be commented on. And hopefully that you have good communication folks who understand that, but also it's about leadership. And, and it's hard because you know, I've been at a variety of different institutions and um, I can say here, you know, sometimes I'm thinking about, should I reach out? I'm going back in my head, you know, back and forth in my, in my head, whether I can reach out, should reach out to the president about some statement. And before I can even contact her, she's texting me about, I'm sending you a statement. Um, but I can tell you, I've been in other places that you fight. 
uh, you fight to, to try to get it. It's the right thing to do. And there's a reality, again, it's that folks will expose that they're committed, but they're really not. And there's a lot of fear around these issues. And that, um, and, and often, you know, I was at one place, you know, I'd fight, I'd fight. And then, you know, um, almost all the institutions around the country would come out with a statement. And then, of course, then four days later, here we go. Um, so sometimes it's just a reality of your environment. Um, knowing that that doesn't mean that you don't stop, that you don't try. But I think when you're in those situations and settings, then you try to figure out other ways to, you know, make your own statements. You know, I, I'd make the statements with student groups or those that are connected to me. Um, and I ask other administrators and others to, to support because people need that. And sometimes, unfortunately, that um, university leadership, and I hesitate to even say leadership sometimes, but those in positions of leadership at universities and, and, and colleges sometimes won't make those statements. Can I just add a very concrete tip because I recognize it came from a colleague of mine and Jennifer's and um, often administrators are more than happy to put out statements, but they don't have the bandwidth or knowledge to actually craft them themselves. And sometimes the university communications folks don't always have that expertise. So for you all who do have that language skill set, draft it up, have a few colleagues sign on and then send it to your UConn people, send it to your student affairs, send it to your senior cabinet. And I guarantee you, they would probably jump on the bandwagon. Thanks for uh, adding. Oh, Jennifer, yeah, please. Yeah, just really quickly on the PowerPoint slide, I shared the, the statement by the Association for Asian American Studies. And I, I think if you just at minimum want to have your university linked to that, um, it'd be better for them to create their own statement. Yale's University's American Studies program just came out with a statement that linked to both the Asian Studies Association statement as well as the AAAS statement. And um, in, in, on our campus free speech guide that I mentioned before on our website, we do have examples of statements that people have put out before and we collated them and put them up there so people could use them. I think in response to these things, there's strength in numbers. So having a statement signed on by many universities, I don't think we see enough of that. Uh, but I also think there's value in different universities responding to a situation in their voice uh, from their leaders. I think students in particular look to the leaders of their own institutions. Um, and pre presidents in general have gotten better this in, at this in recent years, but there was that moment where a lot of them were stumbling because being the public face of anti-racism is not something that most college presidents in general have were kind of often hired to do. I wanna ask this question that's come from uh, Karen Mock, which has to do with solidarity and um, the, the, that in this moment where there's been a lot of stress and blaming, many minorities feel at risk. We focus today mostly on anti-Asian American uh, racism, anti-Asian racism, and um, uh, just racism in general. But, but you know, do, do, are there any comments from you in thinking about what we can do, not just in response to one kind of hatred in this moment, but also the rise in Islamophobia that we've seen? There's been also a rise, huge rise in anti-Semitism too, uh, the effort to kind of blame the spread of, of the virus uh, on those communities as well. So so, you know, what, what do any of you have to say about how we can, can respond in this moment with solidarity and, and thinking about the different groups that have been targeted? I think if you're going to show up and be an anti, if you're going to show up for racism, you have to show up for all racism. And if you're going to show up for social justice, you have, it's intersectional. So we're focusing really specifically on xenophobia and racism, and I certainly don't mean that everyone has to take on the weight of every single ism, but you can't just show up and say, let's just take me as an example. I can't just show up and say, as a Chinese American, I'm directly impacted by this, and so of course I care about um, the xenophobia against people from China or Chinese Americans. Um, I care about this because I care about human beings, and so I care about the fact that the fatality rates for African Americans are higher. I care about the responses in indigenous communities and the lack of resources among American Indian communities in the United States. I care about deeply the rhetoric that's coming out of this White House about borders because I am acutely aware of the fact that there are children who are still locked in cages who are now imperiled further because of the pandemic. Um, and all of it is intertwined in a history of white supremacy and institutional racism. So I think if you're going to show up for Asian Americans right now because of the way that they've been attacked related to COVID-19, that's wonderful. I also think everyone has a responsibility to understand the systemic nature of racism in the United States and really stand up for all forms of systemic racism. 
Yeah, I was just going to add that if xenophobia is anything, it's also extremely anti-immigrant. So you had these memes of cartoon characters where the folks on the Mexico were saying, oh, you can build that wall now because there were more cases on the U.S. side than on the Mexico side, right? And so just to kind of turn it on its end, and we know that a lot of the spread is from congregations that are not Islamic or, you know, only they're very much Christian. They're very much, you know, pan-religious. So um, I think, again, pointing to the facts of the experience and the realities we're facing on the ground are very helpful ways to address some of the forms of discrimination we're seeing too. And also to keep in mind that systemic racism persists because um, systems divide um, minority groups and, and pit us against each other. And so it, it really is important to have, to be good allies, to be good bystanders, and to care about issues that affect all people. We've also had a few questions here about how higher education can use this moment. And, and I often think of it in terms of what is the responsibility of higher education as a sector, you know, faculty across universities, presidents, uh, student affairs, uh, uh, and others, uh, diversity officers. So, you know, are there, do any of you have any ideas of ways that we can use this moment for a broader impact to kind of fight back against some of the things that people have mentioned here? Um, one, uh, Asian Americans being seen as quote unquote perpetual immigrants, uh, you know, this notion that, that you don't belong here, or you're not quite fully American in some way. Um, uh, other, other, uh, questions on here about uh, the Trump administration and the ways that uh, even in its most recent anti-Biden uh, campaign ad was kind of conflating um, uh, Asian, you know, China as a government and, and Asian Americans from here. Um, uh, and other ways that, that the, you know, that, that higher education can kind of use this moment on a more public level um, to promote this kind of anti-racist cause that we've been talking about. This is the afterlife of the panel. What are you all gonna do tomorrow, right? So we came together and we talked about it, but now we gotta do something. I'm looking at you, Ricky. Sure, no, um, you know, and, and I know I've talked about it before, but it, the first thing that pops in, in mind for me is, is educate. You know, it's just an opportunity to educate um, all of constituents on our campus about the various issues um, and why they're important. And when I say the various constituents, you know, Clearly, people always think about students, faculty, staff, but I'm also um, talking about like our regents or trustees. And that's one of the things that I learned from my last institution and certainly brought here is really regularly engaging our regents. And we, we have a good set of regents here um, about the issues that are coming up, um, why they're important, why they should care. Um, and, and what's great about it is now that they ask about these things at the last Board of Regents meeting, they asked, you know, how are our students doing, and particularly our Asian Americans? Are they experiencing any xenophobia? Um, so that is on their radar. Our, our, our Board of Regents has a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that's really, you know, put metrics in place, asking real questions around these things. But that's, again, through, through education. And I mention it because I think in this moment, and, and, and um, for, for folks like me and, and most of us here, we're so committed to these issues and we want institutions to move and do certain things in these statements. The reality with it though is, you know, sometimes when you jump out there on these things, there's backlash and severe backlash. And we have not, often don't do enough to educate certainly our, our regents, our trustees, even our senior leaders about, again, why it's important, but what might happen. Um, and so at least that they know, and, and they have some, um, some knowledge, some thinking through before they're just faced with all of a sudden all this pushback where they're hearing from legislators, alumni, you know, because believe it or not, we're passionate about these issues, but not, not everybody is. And I think that sometimes we can, in our, in, in, on campuses, we can be in this bubble that we believe that everybody it is not, and, and I'm sure that Miriam knows, I certainly know, just been in a role like this, a lot of the negative stuff that we receive, a lot of the stuff, the, the president and others challenging, questioning, why are we spending resources um, on, on conversations like this? Um, so um, I just put that out there as, as something that I think we need to be doing, even again, as part of our education, that it even goes beyond, um, um, 
educating about these issues, but also educating about the other side and, and what folks might be saying or thinking. I think that's important too. I would just add, not to be all Susie Sunshine about it um, towards the end of our hour and a half, but I think if anything, the this crisis situation and the remote instruction and such has actually shined a light on some of the things we've been arguing for and uh, noting, but people have not totally bought it. And so one of those things are the public health disparities that Jennifer mentioned earlier around African American, Native American, Chicano, Latino demographics and socioeconomic demographics, right, that are more heavily impacted by death and um, public health care and lack thereof um, in these communities and domestic violence, right, mental health, all of these areas we've been trying to get more attention for to in the higher educational systems. And then the other thing which has been so great that I've been seeing play out on our campus is that because of the remote online instruction, there's so much more attention to learning disabilities, other kinds of accommodation, uh, closed captioning needs and such. And I feel like all those faculty who didn't want to read their emails from the Student Disability Resource Center on how to accommodate students are now actually having to read them and abide by them. And so if anything, it's, it's spurring better behavior in some arenas. Wanda, um, what do you think? What's tomorrow look like? How can we move beyond this? Uh, I think I think any um, national or global incident that happens that we're all impacted by, and, and certainly this is one of them, it, it really is an educational opportunity. And it's, it's an opportunity to move beyond um, what people are talking about over there, right? Or what's impacting those people over there to think about how this is impacting all of us. Because even the, um, the health disparities, the way that, um, um, African Americans are negatively impacted that, you know, if, if, if nothing else from this pandemic, we can see how interrelated we all are, how interdependent, how much we rely on each other. And so I think there's the potential um, in one on one conversations in the way that we manage our social media um, in public statements that we put out value statements to start to really help people be aware of things and be aware of things at a different level than maybe they had before. Um, it's a little harder to dismiss right now um, some of the, the structural inequities in our system um, and some of the impacts of hateful speech on, um, on people who are being um, physically, physically harmed by that. And so I do think that this creates an opportunity to educate um, in a very impactful way um, that hasn't necessarily uh, been the case in the, in, in the past. And it's interesting that this is also happening um, as, as we're coming up on the presidential election. And so there's gonna be lots of conversations and lots of opportunities um, to educate people about the impact of what people say on the lives of, of, um, of, of all of us really. And Jennifer, uh, you know, what can we do? A more public conversation, a more public uh, reckoning? Like a million dollar question, right? How do we, how are we gonna end racism in the United States? And by ending racism, how do we You don't, you don't know? You don't have it in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess what I could say is that this is the question that I have set to try and answer for myself as a scholar and as a person who cares about um, humanity. I. I'm going to show up and try and be the best anti-racist educator that I can and encourage other people to also be anti-racist educators. And I guess that's the last thing I would say to anyone watching this. I tweeted this out yesterday in, you know, as a way to advertise this webinar. I believe everyone can be an anti-racist educator, no matter what your profession is, no matter what racial or ethnic identity that you have. I think all it really takes is the decision that you must consciously make to learn about the history of racism in the United States and then to speak and act as an anti-racist. And that means not letting things go. It's not good enough just to not actively be racist yourself. You have to actively be anti-racist. And I'll try and figure out a way to say that in as many different ways as possible to as wide an audience as I can get. 
Well, thank you for that. And um, we are out of time. I want to thank everyone out there who stayed with us the whole time and, and join me in thanking our uh, uh, great four panelists today. Um, this has been the uh, second webinar in a series that we've done at Penn. Uh, last week, we did one on online hate and harassment, which you can find up on YouTube. And we will have uh, a few more coming uh, in the weeks ahead. So please stay tuned. Uh, and just finally, you know, thank you so much. I think this is such a, a vital issue and I, I hope to continue the conversation. If uh, anyone has ideas or topics that you would like us to address in, a, in a, an upcoming webinar, uh, please feel free to uh, shoot us an email at um, campusfreespeech at pen.org. And I'll just close by uh, putting up our uh, social information if you want to follow us or support our work. And just please join me again in thanking our uh, great panelists for such an important conversation. Thank you. Thanks to all the great questions too. Absolutely.